last week's message. Uh, I only did a small part of it last week. So I'd like you all to turn to that same section. That's Mark 11 verses 12 to 14 and verses 20 to 21. Mark 11. Just reading the verses again. And on the next day, when they had left Bethany, he was hungry. Seeing at a distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. But he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. He said to it, No one shall eat fruit from you again. And his disciples were listening to what he said. Verse 20. And in the morning, as they were passing by, the disciples saw that the fig tree had withered away from the roots up. And remembering, Peter said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered. And uh, last week, you know, we were talking about just one thing. We didn't actually go into the verse. We're just talking about the idea that Jesus needed things. So he had become a human. Jesus was a human being with every human need and every human weakness and every human desire. And that's why he feels hungry. The son of God feeling hungry. And uh, he goes to the tree and uh, we know what happens. There's, there are no figs on it. But the verse also tells us that it was not the season for figs. You know, for many years, this was something that uh, confused me. If it was not the season for figs, why did Jesus curse it? Why did Jesus curse it? That was, the, that was something that, uh, that uh, confused me for a long time. And so, uh, and Jesus, you know, Jesus felt every human need, every human need. He was the Lord of creation. He made everything and yet he suffered and he needed anything just like any human being did. And uh, that's what we were talking about next week. So uh, now we're looking at these verses again. So Jesus is hungry and he sees a fig tree in the distance. That's what we read. He sees a fig tree at a distance. The tree is in full leaf. So Jesus goes to it hoping to find something to eat. It's in full leaf. He goes to it, hoping to find something to eat. But when he comes to the tree, he finds nothing, nothing but leaves. Yeah. Nothing but leaves. And uh, the text tells us that the time of figs was not yet. The time of figs was not yet. And uh, yet, Jesus curses it. Nothing will grow on you again. And, he, and the tree withers. Okay, now, fig trees... Uh, we know are very common in Israel. They're very common in, in Israel. Uh, in fact, uh, fig, the fig tree is mentioned some 60 times. It's mentioned some 60 times in the Bible. And uh, in fact, in Genesis itself, in the Garden of Eden itself, yeah. we find mention of the fig tree, the leaves yeah. of the fig tree, right? Because when Adam and Eve sin and they are ashamed, they, what do they do? They try to cover their nakedness using the leaves of the fig tree. They, they use the leaves of the fig tree to cut, try and cover their nakedness. And uh, so figs uh, played a vital role in the Middle Eastern diet. Played a vital role. Ripe figs were especially valued. They were especially valued. And fig trees were valued for their shade. It was a sign of peace and prosperity to sit in the shade of one's fig tree. It was a sign of peace and prosperity. You know? To sit in the, sh the shade of your fig tree. And it was under a fig tree that Jesus saw Nathaniel. It was under a fig tree. Yes. And uh, good figs were used as a picture of obedient believers. Good figs were used as a picture of obedient believers while rotten figs were used as a picture of wicked men. The fig has been described, you know, has been used for both good fig and the rotten fig have both been used to describe people. 
and uh, the fig tree was used in the Old Testament as a sign of judgment. As a sign of judgment, it was uh, the fig tree was also used as a symbol of the nation of Israel. You know, many years ago, I remember reading a book, Israel the fig tree, Israel the fig tree, and uh, it was used as a symbol of the nation of Israel. And uh, so, figs, uh, you know. Fig trees grow to a height of maybe 20 to 30 feet uh, and uh, a trunk of some 3 feet. The diameter of the trunk would be around 3 feet and the spread of the branches would be around 25 to 30 feet. So fig trees grow pretty big. They grow pretty big. And uh, now fig trees are unusual in one sense. They're unusual in one sense. So what is that? They produce as many as three crops in a single year. They produce as many as three crops in a single year. Uh, usually most trees produce one crop in a year. The fig tree produces three crops in a single year. The first crop is produced on old wood. Now, when we talk about the crop being produced on old wood, it is not new crop. It is what is remnant from the previous season that it grows in the new season. So it is not newly blossomed fruit. It is what remains from the old wood. That is what grows first. That's what grows first. Because early in the year, these green knobs or buds appear at the ends of the branches. They are called pagans. Actually, that kind of... Uh, olives, they have a name. They're called pagans. Pagans are the fruit that was, uh, was actually uh, the, that process of uh, birthing the fruit happened the previous year, but it remains sort of dormant for some time and it begins to blossom. And that's, what, that's the first fruit that we get. These green knobs at the end of the branches. They're called pagan. And this fruit, it is not as juicy as the later fruit. It is not as juicy as the later fruit. But nevertheless, there is fruit. There is fruit. And it's quite edible. And uh, after the pagan appears, then you have the fig tree. You know, it begins to grow its leaves. And that new growth, the new olives begin to sprout. That is after the pagan, after the pagan. And so the fig tree is unique that it can be in full fruit and full leaf and full bloom at the same time. You know, most trees are not in full fruit and full leaf and full bloom at the same time. They're in different seasons. But the leaf, the fig tree can be in full glory at the same time. That's, that's a unique quality of the fig tree, of the fig tree. So the first crop becomes ripe in June. That's the pagan. It becomes ripe in June. And then you have the second in September and the third in December. So you can harvest the fig tree three times a year. Uh, so when you look at a fig tree and you see that it is covered with leaves, it is only normal to assume that it will have fruit because the pagan will be there. The remnant of last year's growth that grows in the next year. So that is going to be there. That's going to be there. And uh, Jesus uh, sees this fig tree at a distance and he can see the leaves from far off. And he assumes that it's going to have fruit. He goes there, there is no fruit. And that's why we know he curses it. Because the fig tree was deceptive because, uh, you know, it promised, the leaves promised fruit. Because the fig tree can be full of fruit and full of leaves and at the same time. That's how the fig tree is. Because it has figs three times a year. And when Jesus goes up to the tree and he sees that it has only leaves and no fruit, no pagan, no pagan, only leaves. And so uh, that's
that means that the fig tree was deceiving. You know, the leaves meant that there should be fruit. It could produce fruit, but it had no fruit. It had no fruit. So there was, uh, there was nothing wrong with the soil. There was nothing wrong with the sap. There was nothing wrong with the fruit. There was nothing wrong with the location. It was on good soil. It enjoyed the sunshine and the rain, but it had no fruit. It had no fruit. Uh, because in April, it has what you call early fruit. That's pagan. That's the early fruit. It's not as luscious and as tasty as the later fruit, but nevertheless, it is edible fruit. But this fruit did not have any pagan. And that is why we see that Jesus curses it. Jesus curses it. Uh, so this tree was good for, it had nothing to offer and it was useless. It was fit for nothing except to be chopped down and fed into the fire. That's why Jesus curses it. Uh, now, we know the title, of, does anybody remember the title of this message? I did not mention the title, but I mentioned it last year, last week. The fruitless fig tree, the fruitless fig tree, the fruitless fig tree. And uh, the fig tree is supposed to be in fruit all the time, all the time, but it was a, a, a fruitless fig tree. You know, if you look at it, you know, just before, just before Jesus curses this fig tree, uh, this happens during what we now call Passion Week, the week before his crucifixion. The week before his crucifixion. He had come to Jerusalem as the king. What kind of a king did he come in? He came riding on an ass, right? Usually kings ride on horses. On horses. horses. That's the, the power. The powerful king always rides on a horse. Kings never ride on donkeys, on asses. But Jesus came riding a, an ass, a colt. The fall of an ass. Uh, as we read in uh, Zechariah, this is what Zechariah says. Behold, your king comes to you triumphant and victorious. He's humble and riding on an ass, on a colt, the foal of an ass. So this is a prophecy by Zechariah in the Old Testament. This is how the king is going to come. So Jesus is fulfilling prophecy when he is riding this colt because he is a king. But he's a king with a difference. He's not a king who has come to fight. He's not a king he has, who has come to fight. Uh, you know, in the Old Testament, we uh, see, we often see uh, that uh, asses or donkeys were used to carry gifts. You know, when, uh, like when uh, Jacob and Esau, when they're that before the reunion, he sends uh, uh, gifts on donkeys, and often they're used to carry gifts and. Uh, Donkeys and asses are used to carry gifts to someone. Marriages, you're sending gifts to the wife's house or to the, to the husband's house. And uh, of course, the first gift, we have Abraham riding, riding on a donkey. When? When he goes to sacrifice Isaac. When he goes to sacrifice Isaac. He wasn't on a horse. He wasn't on a horse. When he goes to sacrifice Isaac. And... Uh, so riding on a horse, riding on a ha ass, on a donkey, symbolizes a king of peace, a king of service, a king of sacrifice. So that is why, that is how Jesus came. He came for peace, for service and for sacrifice. He did not come as a judge. That's the next time he's going to come, he's going to come as a judge. But the first time he came to sacrifice himself. And so this ass riding on that ass is so symbolic so symbolic and he was fulfilling old old testament prophecy because the zechariah had said this is how your king is going to come riding on an ass riding on an ass and so jesus has come and jesus is going to be crucified he knows that 
they you know they uh, they threw down their cloaks and uh, palm fronds and all on the ground to welcome this king him remember they were greeting him and calling and uh, greeting his name when he came uh, yeah on palm sunday and we remember it as palm sunday so they were greeting as the king but now they're going to crucify that same king they're going to crucify him and he knows it he knows that is why he has come he hasn't come to make war he has come to make peace he has come to make peace and uh, so uh, yeah and so uh, israel so that is why he curses israel because israel is like this fruitless fig tree because he knows what's going to happen to him they welcomed him as king but he knows what's going to happen him happen to him on friday he knows he's going to be second he's going to be crucified and so israel had shown all the signs of spiritual life but they had no fruit they showed they followed all the rituals all the rituals all the jewish traditions they followed every single one of them but there was no fruit there was no fruit they were keeping the letter of the law they were keeping the letter of the law and they did not understand the spirit of the law they were carrying out the temple ceremonies they were observing the ancient feasts and sacrifices they were religious in every detail but they had no spiritual fruit they had no spiritual fruit so uh, you know when you look at it in those days what was israel what was israel israel was god's representative on earth just as we are god's representative on earth now and our duty is to lead others to christ and israel's duty was to lead others to but they they lost sight of all that they were just following the letter of the law they did not have any idea about the spirit of the law so they had no fruit and that is why he is actually when he's cursing the tree he's talking to israel and when he's talking to israel he's also talking to us so if we have no fruit we will be cursed we will be cursed that's what he's saying so israel had been given every advantage that that could be given to a people they had received the personal attention and redemption of almighty god because they were god's people remember there was nobody else on the face of the earth who could claim to be god's people the only people who could claim to be god's people and they were that they were that and they had the attention and the redemption of almighty god and they had been planted in a good land god had planted them in a good land a land that he promised to them a land that he promised to them. they had the word of god the prophets of god and the temple of god the only people in the whole world who had the temple of god they had the temple of god so the word of god the prophets of god and the temple of god they had everything they needed for a bumper crop for a spiritual bumper crop but they were fruitless they were fruitless so israel had no fruit and there would be none in the future <laughs> as jesus knew it there would be none in the future so they were useless spiritually so spiritually they were useless and they were fit for nothing but the fires of judgment so that is why he curses the tree he's talking to his nation he's talking to us if we have no fruit we will be cursed we will be thrown into the fire of judgment now uh, yeah so as i was saying before the message to us is exactly the same exactly the same where is the fruit in my life that's the question i need to ask myself where is the fruit in my life where is the fruit in my life does god see me bearing fruit for his glory or does he see a tree that is gone to leaf gone to leaf meaning full of leaves something that looks wonderful and thriving but fruitless so am i covered with leaves adorned with leaves and am i fruitless that's the question that i need to ask myself because we we are just like israel you know we are we have every spiritual advantage god has to offer because we have his word we have his church and we have his spirit we have his word his church and his spirit israel had the the prophets 
and the temple, right? And we have the Word and the Spirit of God. We have the Spirit of God. So, He has blessed us in abundance. So, where is our fruit? Where is our fruit? That's the question. We have all the appearances of life. We, have, we use the right Bible, we sing the right songs, we preach the right message. <laughs> I preach the right message and walk the right path. And people look at this church and uh, they see our leaves. They see our leaves and we have a reputation. We have a reputation in the community. But are we really in love with Jesus? Are we really in love with Jesus? Are we really in love with each other? Is Jesus the centerpiece of all that... I do is there real commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ or am I just giving him lip service on Sunday so is my faith confined to what I do on Sunday or do I have a vibrant relationship yes yeah, Paul was saying a relationship do I have a vibrant relationship with Jesus Christ so as a church and as an individual am I all leaves is there fruit in my life so let's, let's, you know, what is the fruit? How do you measure the fruit in one's life? Well, first of all, one question that I can ask myself is, is Jesus really the first priority in my life? Or is his will, his worship and his work a second thought? So is it the first thought in my life or is it the second thought? So do I have all the appearance of salvation but no real commitment do I have just the appearance and not real commitment so do I shout and testify and worship on Sundays and uh, while in my heart I carry unforgiveness do I shout and worship and testify on Sundays while in my heart do I carry unforgiveness towards someone towards my neighbor towards someone who hurt me so do I act saved at church but live like the devil the rest of the time so do I live like a do I act saved in church and live like the devil otherwise so do I plan my life around all the things that I want or do I plan my life around all the things that God wants so is God an afterthought or is either does he have first place in my life this is what I need to ask myself so real fruit real fruit what I want in my life is real fruit because fruit is always the evidence of genuine salvation you know, fruit is always the evidence of genuine salvation when a person is saved by grace there will be fruit there will be fruit so what is fruit well fruit first of all is a changed life a changed life I should always whatever happens in my life I should always be able to think to the past and say that if this had happened before this is not how I would have responded but now I'm responding in a different way because Jesus is in mine I should be able to see I should always be able to point out to myself the evidence of a changed life this is not to show anybody else but in my heart I should see the evidence of a changed life and I should be a vibrant witness I should be a vibrant witness a witness for what Jesus Christ has done in my life so am I witnessing what Jesus Christ has done for me to the rest of the world or am I not am I worried about other things am I worried about offending people and saying things out of place or am I willing to testify and glorify his name always? And uh, I should always have the evidence of the inward life. Again, the inward life. Because, you know, our spirit. When was our spirit born? Our spirit was born when we were born again, right? When we talk about being born again, what is that? It is the birth of the spirit on the inside. Otherwise, it's just the body and the soul. There's no spirit. It is when we are born again that the spirit comes to life. And our spirit is growing. And we need to see that. We need to see that. We need to observe that. We need to realize that, that the spirit is growing. These are all evidences of the fruits in our life. 
And uh, now, not everyone bears the same amount of fruit. No doubt about it. Not everybody bears the same amount of fruit. Not everybody bears the same fruit. But everyone who is saved will bear some fruit. Everyone who is saved will bear some fruit. In fact, everyone in this world will bear fruit. Even if you're not saved, you will bear fruit. You will bear fruit. Even if you're not saved, you will bear fruit. But only if we are in a right relationship with Almighty God will we bear His fruit. So we need to bear His fruit in our lives. That is what we need to do. It is not to bear fruit. Because even if you're just living your own life, you'll bear. Because you'll do something valid and meaningful and good. You will. But we need to bear his fruit. We need to bear his fruit. Otherwise, we are wasting our lives. You know, bearing our own good fruit is meaningless. Because we need to bear his fruit. We need to bear his fruit. That's what we need to do. And so... Yeah, so now the Lord, uh, you know, he sees this fig tree without fruit and uh, he pronounced a curse upon it. He pronounced a curse upon it, right? He declared that it would be fruitless forever. Uh, now some people, like I said before, some people think that uh, Jesus, uh, that it didn't make sense to me. It didn't make sense to me, the, the curse that Jesus uh, placed on the tree. But this is why he did it, because... It was fruitless. It was fruitless. And as a believer, we are meant to be always fruitful. Because our, our, our fruit is not seasonal. As a believer, my fruit is not seasonal. I should always be fruitful. I should always be fruitful. I should always be fruitful. Uh, Alright. So, Jesus curses the tree for its hypocrisy. Why does... Why does he curse the tree? Because it's being a hypocrite. How is it being a hypocrite? Because it is full of leaves and yet it has no fruit. It is full of leaves and yet it has no fruit. Uh, again, he's talking about his nation. He's talking about Israel. Because they're following all the rituals, all the traditions, but they have no real fruit. Because dead religion, dead religion, dead religion is bondage. Dead religion is bondage. You know, we Christianity is uh, not a religion; it's a relationship. And all religions are dead religions, and they lead us into bondage. What is the bondage? Following the rituals. Just following the rituals is a bondage, yeah. without having a real relationship with God. Now, uh, when we look at this nation historically, I told you he curses this nation. Jesus curses Israel, and uh, as a result of that. They were destroyed by Rome in 70 AD and the population that survived was scattered around the world. We know that, right? In 70 AD, Titus, General Titus, was the last Roman general who destroyed Israel and they were scattered around the world. Their nation ceased to exist for nearly 1,900 years. For 1,900 years, there was no nation of Israel. The nation was reborn in 1948, but still stands under God's judgment to this day. It was reborn in 1948, but it's still under God's judgment. That's interesting, you know, because you have God's favor and God's judgment on the nation of Israel. You see God's favor and God's judgment. Because even the enemies of Israel can see God's favor on them. Even the enemies of Israel can see God's favor on them. Uh, when you talk about enemies, you know, we're talking about from the six who attacked them in 1948. You know, six nations attacked Israel in 1948. From that six to the ten who don't recognize their right to exist even now in 2023. Even in 2023, there are ten nations that do not recognize the right of Israel to exist. Even now. So these are all the enemies of Israel. But even the enemies of Israel can see God's favor on them. They can see God's favor on them. They have existed as a nation for just 75 years. That's all. They've existed as a nation for just 75 years. 
and yet they lead the world in everything. In 75 years, they have become world leaders. This is the favor of God. In 75 years, they've become world leaders. They lead the world in everything except in knowing Jesus. The only thing they do not lead the world in is in knowing Jesus. That's because of God's curse on them. They've been blinded. But in everything else, in everything else, they lead the whole world. They lead the whole world in everything else. Water production. Remember, I told you about from thin air. They've made a machine that can make water from thin air. Food production. You know, when 75 years ago, when Israel went to, they, were, they went there to establish that country, it was a desert. And now they're growing fruits and vegetables and they're exporting food. They're exporting fruits and vegetables. In 75 years, I'm thinking in India, how many years have we been farming? And now we're still struggling, we're still struggling. In 75 years, they changed a desert into a garden and they're exporting food and, and water and IT and in self-defense, self-defense. No, nobody can touch them, nobody can touch them. Advanced weaponry, nobody can touch them. They're so advanced, they're so advanced in every single thing. But on the day, so right, I told you, right now they are under the curse of God. That is why they do not, they do not accept Jesus. But one day when Jesus returns in glory, the curse will be lifted and Israel will flourish in faith again. Israel will flourish in faith. So you need to remember that Israel is flourishing in every single thing except in faith. And one day soon, when Jesus returns, the blindness will be lifted and they will flourish in you know, interestingly, uh, there's only one nation that God has blinded to His Son. There's only one nation that God has blinded to the salvation that is provided by Jesus Christ. And that is the nation of Israel as a punishment, as a punishment. And uh, so because God blinded them, it is God's responsibility to open their eyes, right? It is God's responsibility to open their eyes. And He's going to do that soon. He's going to do that soon. And on that day, Israel will turn to God as a nation. As a nation. They'll turn to God. So, uh, anyhow, back to this. Back to the fig tree. The fig tree. So, the same scenario, you know, the same judgment that Israel is coming on, under is applicable to us as well. The same judgment is applicable. When we do not have a vibrant close relationship with God we will end up we are placing ourselves ready for in the path of judgment because you know God always makes an effort even in the, the case of the fig tree Jesus from afar off he sees the fig tree and he goes up to the tree and he examines carefully to find that there is no fruit right he doesn't pronounce the judgment on it from afar he comes close up to it he close, comes close up to the tree and he curses it. So, if we are hypocritical and we don't have fruit as he desires, this should be our fear. We should be afraid. We should be afraid. Because uh, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, 27, Therefore, I do not run without a definite goal. I do not flail around like one beating the air. I strictly discipline my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I'm, I myself will not somehow be disqualified. This is what Paul says. This is what Paul says. So let's be careful. This is applicable to us. You know, We are preaching. I'm here preaching the gospel. And, but I need to be careful because God is looking for the fruits in my life. So a pretense of religion is just like the flaunting of leaves. The show of leaves, the display of leaves. God will judge that too. So God expects us to be fruitful. God expects us to be fruitful. And if we are not fruitful, we can expect the personal attention of the vine dresser in our lives. If we are not fruitful, what does the wine dresser do? What does the farmer do? He dresses the wine. When the wine is not fruitful, he comes and he dresses it. He, he cuts bits away. Huh? He... he he, he hurts the wine. The wine will think that the, that the wine dresser is hurting me. But that's what God does. He wants to make us fruitful. He wants to make us fruitful. 
So God wants us to become fruitful. And uh, we we should bear fruit, more fruit, and much fruit. That's what that's why we're placed here. We're here to bear fruit and to bear much fruit. And that's what he wants us to do for his glory. And uh, so And the next day, the next day uh, when the disciples are passing by, they see this tree. And uh, what do they see? They see that the fig tree was dried up from the roots. It was dried up from the roots. That is, uh, that is not natural. <laughs> because usually how does a tree dry up? It dries up, dries up from the leaves, from the top to the bottom. The tree always dries up. The natural drying is always from the top to the bottom. The leaves go, the branches break off, and the root is the last to be damaged, always. But here, because of divine judgment, it withered up from the root. The judgment was on the root, and it withered from there. And so this miracle is a clear demonstration of, of the Lord's sovereignty over all things over nature, over everything. He has complete sovereignty over everything. Because usually it's from top to bottom. Never from bottom to up. That was God's judgment. That was God's judgment. It's a picture of total destruction. Total destruction. Because usually when a tree dries up, you know, you, you cut off all the branches and you pour a lot of water into the root and something will sprout up again. But in this case, nothing can happen. Nothing can happen. And this is, you know, this was the message of John the Baptist also, you know, he said, And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that bringeth not good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. This is what John the Baptist said. The axe is placed at the base of the tree. So let's be careful. Let's be careful. So, everyone in this room, let's just remember that uh, God who takes a lost sinner and saves his soul and blesses his life, is also the God who will judge the same sin. He's also the God who will judge it. So let us uh, let us be let us be close to God so that He will bless us. Because if we refuse to honor and obey and serve Him, He will bring chastisement on us, and He will He can fill us up, and He can also leave us dry and empty. You know, I, I was just reading about this. God can fill us up and God can also leave us dry and empty. Because one of the judgments of God, you know, judgments, what are the judgments of God? Like fire and flood and all those things, pestilence, right? But abandonment is also a judgment of God. Abandonment. What is abandonment? Yeah, God lets us be, just leaves us there. Nothing, nothing can ever grow on our inside. We are alive on this, in this world, but we can't do anything. So remember, abandonment, abandonment is also a judgment too. So let us never be in a state where we stand in the path of God's judgment. Because He has not placed us in this world to stand in the path of His judgment. Because we are here to, to glory, to glorify His name and to grow as His children. So let us never be all leaf and no fruit. Let us never be all leaf and no fruit. Because, you know, take the case of Judas Iscariot. He was one of the 12 disciples, right? He was one of the 12 disciples. One of the 12. Close, close, so close to Jesus. I mean, he's the one who betrayed him. He's the one who betrayed him. So, let us be sure that we know him and we are growing in him and we're getting closer and closer to him. Because the Lord is looking for fruit in the lives of his people. And he's looking for fruit in the life of his church. And when he's looking at you and me also, he's looking out for fruit. Let us be fruitful in the Lord.